We're considering harmonized uh, ship categorization program, wherein NIMASA and Nigerian Content Development Monitoring Board will have same uh, categorization for vessels. The other one is that we're also looking at the projected demand uh, trajectory for vessels that will be needed in the oil and gas industry over the next five to ten years so that we can get the local entrepreneurs or the ship owners prepared to meet the demands of the oil and gas industry. Then we're also looking at a manpower audit. What are the skill gaps in the industry? What skills do we need in the industry? And how do we grow those skills to meet uh, local demand and demand of the industry? And as part of the manpower audit, we're going to vet the, the NIMASA Nigerian Seafarers Development Program, uh, wherein we are also looking at jointly providing sea time for those who have undergone the program to enable them qualify for the certificate of competency so that they become employable. How is that program going right now for the seafarers? How is it going right now? And is there a time frame for them to receive this certification? We've so far gotten 2,500 persons undergo the program, but in the interim, we have secured, as an intervention again, we have secured sea time for nothing less than 300 persons in the next one month. Now, they will be, going, they will, they will be undergoing sea time in Egypt and in the United Kingdom. Uh, in the days ahead, or in the months and weeks ahead, we hope that more persons uh, will be provided sea time. But there's another collaboration with Nigerian Content Development Mon uh, Monitoring Board. We are looking at a second collaboration with the Ship Owners Association of Nigeria. These two are all aimed at providing sea time for our young cadets that have undergone training, are qualified as either uh, marine engineers, qualified um, as maybe nautical scientists, um, seafarer, but they need to uh, carry out their sea time and get the necessary certification. So away from capacity building, let's go to the environment now. To what extent is NIMASA adhering to MAPO Annex 6? Now, um, well, MAPO Annex 6 speaks substantially to gas emission uh, at, at, by vessels, and which ultimately, Im ultimately impacts uh, the climate and, of course, leads to um, contributing to the carbon fit footprint on our environment. We appreciate the value, and so uh, the first step we have taken is sensitization. We are engaging with in industry stakeholders. Ultimately, we're going to make a decision whether we're going to be a party to that convention or not, but I believe we're going to be a party to that convention. Um, so far, so good. In preliminary studies show that we're already beginning to reduce carbon footprints uh, within our maritime domain. Um, we, are, we are going for clean fuel. Most ship users know that that's what we're doing. Uh, we prefer gas, ships powered by gas, and um, uh, ships powered by, by fuel or bunker with less sulfur um, imprints in it. So I think that we're making progress in that direction. Right. You, you also spoke a lot about the Cabotad Vessel Financing Fund, but talk us through those reasons, particular reasons that are, you know, delaying the disbursement of those uh, funds. Well, we have, we're learning from the mistakes of the recent past, especially as it relates to ship acquisition and shipbuilding fund, and as well as the aviation fund. Uh, we're learning from those experiences. And so what we're doing is to look at the guideline again and see if there are other models that will achieve the same purpose without going down the path of the ship acquisition and shipbuilding fund. We don't want a, a case where we would disburse funds and we're not going to be able to recover it. Mind you, the funds will be to grow tonnage. It is not a grant given to businessmen and women to take and build more houses. So. Um, we're looking at a financing structure. We think that what we have is good, but it needs to be strengthened, wherein the primary lending institutions will bring in 35% of the funds that we need. The, from the capital vessel financing fund, you can assess 50% as, uh, whereas the man who is the visioner of the project will also contribute 15% equity. That's a good model, but we're tweaking it a bit. We're looking at it a bit, and I believe that once we're true with that process, people will be able to assess the carbon dioxide vessel financing fund and it will crash interest rate because the greatest challenge for local investors who invest in ship building and ship acquisition is cap 
cost of funding, whereas in other climbs, is between 1% and 5%. In our climb here, is double digit between 20 and 27%, and that will not make them competitive. And the amortization period for vessel financing is also usually long, fairly long, between 15 and 20 years, as well as the gestation period for investment in ships. You know, the lifespan of a ship is between 70 and 100 years. That's the lifespan of a ship, actually. A ship is not just an asset that you're going to acquire for a short time. It's long term, and the station period is fairly long, but once you begin to make money, it's forever. Okay. But some mariners are of the opinion that, you know, these funds that can be put in a maritime bank, you know, to, you know, turn around these funds. What's, what's your take on that generally? Yeah, we've looked at the model of the maritime bank. It's got its own challenges. Now, who are those who will invest in maritime bank? Is it going to be another government bank? And people will see the funds that they're in as their own dividends of democracy. Is that what we're looking at? I don't think the maritime bank is the solution. We're looking at different models. But one of the models we're not looking at at the short term is the, mod, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, what is it called, maritime bank option. It's not one of the options we're looking at. Okay, so what other models are, are you looking at? Now, we're looking at where we provide guarantees for our entrepreneurs. If they're going to source fund from the international market, you, now, now the country can't send guarantee for them. Listen, there is a contract like for a them. Sovereign guarantee. Sovereign guarantee. There's a contract for them. If you uh, partner with them and build this vessel, there's already a contract. If they default, we take charge of the vessel and pay you back your money. And so it's no risk for those who are investing, those that are partnering with, those the ship building companies that are partnering with. But most importantly, we're looking at in-country value addition and retention of um, um, capital in-country. And so for us, our preference is that these vessels are built in country, not in China, not in the shipyard of Korea. And to do that, we need to invest in infrastructural development. We need to invest in our steel industry. We need to invest in building skills base. Building vessels is a fairly complex process that involves different skills. Those who do air conditioning, those who do electrical, those who do welding, those who, naval architects who design the vessel, it generates a lot of employment, but it involves different skills too. And I believe that it will add more value here, it will create more employment, it will help us retain more capital. Right, and finally, what strategies are in place to tap into the great potential of the blue economy? Now, as a first step, we want to put in place a framework to tap into the blue economy. The Federal Ministry of Transportation has commissioned a team to develop the country blue economy policy. Now, the, to follow closely at the heels of the country blue economy policy is a country blue economy strategy plan. And now, it's going to be a roadmap on how we tap into the blue economy, including seabed mining and, of course, all the resources you can get from the ocean.